In this section, we're going to look at how to apply the Fourier transform to solve for the output of a system given an input. And what's very powerful about the Fourier transform that takes us beyond the earlier Fourier series technique is we can work with inputs that are not periodic functions. So as an example, uh, you can take a look at table 5-6 in the textbook for several uh, standard Fourier transform uh, pairs that go with signals. And for our example right now, we're going to let x of t, the input to a circuit that we'll present in a minute, we're going to let it be a causal exponential decay. And we can look at the Fourier transform table and see that this matches line 7a in the table. And that tells us that if x of t is e to the minus at u of t, then x of omega is going to be 1 over a plus j omega. So there we have an input signal that is not periodic, so we don't have the uh, discrete uh, function uh, that we do for the Fourier series, but we have a continuous function that has complex values, uh, and for the decay parameter a, we can substitute in a range of omega, and we get the various complex values out. Uh, for our example here, we'll do a time constant of one second, so we'll let a be 1 over our time constant, and we'll just let it be a one-second time constant. Now, we need a circuit. So let's take the circuit that we analyzed for a Fourier series, a periodic input, from section 5.2. And for review, that circuit uh, had a resistor in series with a capacitor, and the capacitor was in parallel with an inductor. And then we saw that we could find the system, the, the uh, response to a sinusoid um, using the transfer function. So we have impedance here, one, one over J omega C and J omega L. And we w uh, went through the voltage divider to say, okay, let's let this be the output voltage over here across the parallel combination of the capacitor and inductor. And we had, this was input voltage. Now we've removed the restriction that the input voltage be a periodic signal as we had for our earlier phaser based and then Fourier series analysis. So for this example, we're going to let it be an exponential decay. Now, of course, you know how to solve a system like this using Laplace methods and methods that you learned in circuits, but this method will uh, take us to a, a wide variety of signals and uh, without having to explicitly solve the differential equations. Uh, and uh, it'll also give us some very powerful visualization and analysis techniques for how the input signal and the system are interacting. And we're going to see those shortly, and we will do a MATLAB demo. So please go back to the Section 5.2 and the associated lecture um, if, if you wish for review. But we did find uh, back there that the output-to-input relationship for the output phaser to the input phaser at some omega, and we went through some simplifications, and what we ended up with was, it was denominator one minus omega squared LC, plus an imaginary term in the denominator with value omega L, and the numerator was just J omega L. That was about four steps doing a, a voltage divider rule using the impedances of the three components. So we, we ended up with that function, and uh, we then used it 
to modify individual phasers, but it also describes the system as a function of continuous frequency. There's nothing inherent in how we derived it that restricts it to the discrete frequencies of the Fourier transform. So we have there a complex valued function of the continuous frequency uh, omega. And we're going to follow the example that we did in 5.2, where the capacitor value is going to be 1 over 3 pi farads. The inductor value is also going to be 1 over th uh, 3 pi. And um, the resistor value we'll, we're going to leave at 1 ohm for this example. The MATLAB script will allow you to change the various parameters to see how the system uh, response changes and how it interacts with the signal. So what we do at this point to find the output is we say that y of omega is equal to h of omega times x of omega. This is the continuous frequency version of what we were doing for discrete phasers in the Fourier series in section 5-5 and earlier in the chapter. But now instead of omega being one of a discrete frequency, omega can be any frequency. And uh, for this case here, I have 1 over um, a, which a is equal to 1, j omega, times the fraction for um, uh, my h of omega. I'm right writing, uh, I wrote the x first here, but uh, of course it's a multiplication, so the order doesn't matter. And here is the h of omega. Now we could um, expand this by partial fractions or other techniques. And then we, we would do an inverse Fourier transform looking for matching pairs from the table, uh, table 5-6. Uh, um, or, uh, so similar to how you would solve for a Laplace transform response. Uh, and if it's simple enough, we may do that. Uh, if it's more complicated, we could use a symbolic solver on a computer. Or what's very commonly done um, using a computer is we calculate this numerically. For um, a wide variety of frequencies, omega, we calculate this complex value for the circuit parameters and A, the time constant, and we get a complex valued function that we then graph, and then we do numerical integration of the inverse Fourier transform formula to get back to the time domain waveform y of t. So uh, we could do it, as I said, analytically, or we could do it um, numerically by evaluating those integrals uh, on a numeric integration program on a computer. Um, I do that here on the next slide, and we have results here. Going from left to right, we have three graphs associated with the system input. The circuit itself, which is the system, and the system output. The top row of graphs are functions of time. The middle graphs are magnitude of the Fourier transform as a function of omega. And the bottom graph is the phase angle of the, the complex valued Fourier transform as a function of omega. So here we can see we have our input signal which is our exponential decay. And by doing the Fourier transform where we got one over one plus J omega, that's the A parameter there, we have now graphed that as a magnitude and a phase angle for this parameter. And I'm doing the frequency axis in Hertz. So this goes up to 20 Hertz over on the right. Then remember our frequency response function was j omega l over r1 minus omega squared lc. 
plus j omega l. And we graph that function here for the given parameters of r, l, and c. And we see we have a phase and a magnitude. I am plotting it for both negative frequencies and positive frequencies. Because the Fourier transform, uh, like the exponential version of the Fourier series, uh, is complex valued, we need the negative and the positive frequency components along with conjugate symmetry to add up and give us uh, a real system response for real input voltages and currents. Now, it does obey conjugate symmetry where the magnitude function is even, it's mirrored left to right, but the phases are, have odd symmetry. So that is because at a negative frequency, we have a conjugate value of what we have at the corresponding positive frequency. The phase angles are negatives, but the magnitude of the complex number is the same. Now that we have these two um, functions, we take the complex valued functions uh, here for our x of omega and here for our h of omega, and we multiply the complex valued functions together to get y of omega. Then we have um, either analytically or numerically, we have the um, computer calculate y of omega, the output. So here we have our h of omega, and here we have our x of omega those two items get multiplied and they as a function of the frequency omega and we get the y of omega. Now we got these two by doing the Fourier transform of the input and uh, we got the h of omega by in this case doing a uh, um, using a voltage divider with the impedances of the uh, components. Um, now, in some cases, you would have the impulse response, and you would do the Fourier transform, and that would give you the um, transfer function, h of omega here. But in this case, we didn't, did not work it in that direction. Now, over on the right, we have this complex-valued function, y of omega, we do the inverse Fourier transform. Here I had MATLAB do it numerically, and it gives me the system output. Now, another thing that we can do, which is very cool, is we can take the h of omega that we calculated. We can also do an inverse Fourier transform on it to get the impulse response. The reason this works is because if we have x of t is an impulse, which is how we probe a system if we want the impulse response, that implies x of omega equals 1. So you can apply the Fourier uh, transform integral to the delta, and the sampling property just gives us a, a 1 everywhere for x of omega. So in that case, what happens is the output is going to be h of omega times x of omega, but x of omega is 1. So the output will be the Fourier transform of the response to the impulse, which is what we have here, h of omega. And I had MATLAB do an inverse Fourier transform on it to give us the impulse response. Now, I want to point out a couple more things before I wrap up the video lecture. One of them is we notice that there is some ringing here um, before time equals zero in the impulse response. Now, how can that be? I have a real RLC circuit. How could it possibly be giving me outputs before an input was applied? And the, the answer, and... Um, I'll give a hint. You may want to pause the video. The answer comes in this graph, especially right here, the magnitude or the phase, but especially the magnitude of h of omega. There's, there's a hint there. So the, the answer is when we had MATLAB approximate h of omega, 
I did not go to infinity in frequency. I had to choose a stopping point. And I chose a stopping point here that was just a little bit above 15 hertz. So this uh, H of omega really has non-zero values going out to infinity. And similarly, the X of omega does too. It gets quite small, but we can see even as omega gets large, the magnitude doesn't get quite to zero. So we made a numeric approximation on the computer that was missing these tails for high frequency values. And that, when you remove high frequency components or you don't approximate enough of them, you get ringing and rounding off of the time domain waveforms. So we see that very clearly here with some ringing and that ringing uh, is going to be largest where there are discontinuities. So an impulse hit the circuit and there was suddenly an output voltage that decayed, but there was a, dis a discontinuity there um, and a, a very quick jump. So that resulted with high frequencies being missing to this ringing to spilling, being spilling over to the left. As you add higher frequency components, this will get more and more accurate. We see a similar ringing here in the output because the functions were multiplied together, um, and uh, but it's quite a good approximation. If we want a better approximation, we would do a, the calculation to much higher than 15 hertz. We might go to 50 hertz or 100 hertz, but it's a trade-off. As we go to higher frequencies, I need to do more calculations on the computer, and I need more memory to hold the values. At this point, I encourage you to go look at the corresponding MATLAB script that walks through this problem and actually shows the Fourier transform equations and other equations in MATLAB form that were used to generate this example. You can try changing circuit parameters. You can try changing the input and changing the, the definition of its Fourier transform. And there are other parameters that you can experiment with to understand better how the Fourier transform allows us to analyze and find the output of a circuit for a non-periodic input.